um, to the URI hosted webinar on fundraising for the grassroots. We're going to be looking today at where's the money hiding, a uh, question I'm sure many of us have or else we would not be here. Uh, thank you so much for having us. Um, my presenters here are turning on their cameras so you can see uh, their faces. And just so everyone knows as well, we are recording this um, session so that people who weren't able to make it at this time um, can have access to it later. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a tour around the technology that we're using so you can use it best, uh, we're on a platform called Bitmarker. Um, and on the right-hand side of your screen, you should see the chat box. Um, that is where you can um, send messages to um, everyone who's here on the webinar. So myself and the presenters will get them, as well as all of the other attendees. Um, if at any point you want to um, share uh, with people privately, you can click on the People tab, which is next to the Chat um, tab on the column that the chat box is in, just look straight up and there should be one that says people, and you'll be able to send private messages to people. This will come in handy later if you want to ask a question but not have your name attached to it. Um, and then if you are having any sort of technical trouble, you can email support at bigmarker.com and they will respond live. Uh, so even though it is an email address, they'll give you quick service. So please do that if you're having any sort of trouble. Um, and again, that email address is support at bigmarker.com. Um, and then you could also check out the attendee guide if you're having trouble. I'll put a link to that in the chat box so that you can go to that if um, you need some help. Uh, and this uh, webinar is being hosted by United Religions Initiative uh, in North America. And one of the things that we often do to start meetings, um, actually almost exclusively every meeting is started with some sort of a blessing or a moment to bring us all fully into this space together. And so I've asked um, Barry Gargan, she is a CC liaison with United Religions Initiative in Southern Africa, and she is going to um, give us our blessing this morning. And so, Barry, if you um, I think your mic should be unmuted if you want to give us a blessing, and then we'll continue with the rest of what we're doing uh, today. Thank you so much, Sari. Can you hear me clearly? I can hear you clearly. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for the honor of opening with this blessing. If all of us could just take a moment to close our eyes and breathe into this moment, becoming aware of any stresses or tensions that we may be carrying in our bodies and allowing them to simply dissolve and melt away down into the earth to Mother Earth who is waiting to embrace all of these things which do not serve us in this moment and to take them and transmute them into food for the plants and the flowers and the trees. And as you continue to breathe into your space, just take a moment to get, in, to get into your own heart, to check in with your own heart. And notice that you are one point of light around this globe. We are all positioned so very strategically around this beautiful world of ours and each of us a point of light. And if you could send a beam of light from your heart now to all of the other participants on this call, simply checking in, connecting, and allowing that flow of love and light and energy between all of us. And as that flow is allowed, that universal energy flow grows and is allowed to flow like a river, lighting up the entire globe and feeling that flow of abundance and feeling our hearts swell in gratitude for this moment, for the information that will be shared, for the connections that will be made, for the abundance that will be unlocked as we allow the universal energy flow into this moment and we give grateful thanks to the source of all emanations and so it is. And so it is. Thank you, Barry, for that beautiful blessing to bring us here today. Thank you. Um, I think my camera should be turning. There we go. Now you can see me. Um, and so next I just want to introduce uh, who is hosting this webinar. As I mentioned, it, um, 
We're an organization called United Religions Initiative, and, and specifically this is being hosted by our North America region. We are a global grassroots interfaith network, um, which means that we're a network of peace builders, that people all around the world who are working to end religiously motivated violence and to create cultures of peace, justice, and healing for the earth and all living beings. Um, and so one thing that we do as a network to support um, all of the members who are across the globe is to provide resources. And that's what we're doing here today, today is providing a resource um, for our Cooperation Circle members. URI is made up of 744 Cooperation Circles in 92 countries around the world. Uh, and I just love to say that number because it gives me so much encouragement when we look around and we see the news. And, you know, many things are happening, but think about that number of people from around the globe who are all working for peace. And a cooperation circle at minimum is seven people of three or more faiths. And so multiply these by tens and by twenties and by hundreds. Um, and that is what URI is. So thank you for being with us here today. And so our first panelist is Danya Wellman. She is co-founder of the Women's Interfaith Group, Women Transcending Boundaries, and she's also vice chair of the North America Leadership Council for United Religions Initiative. Danya is joining us from Syracuse, New York, and I'm going to turn her camera on now so you can see her. Uh, or Danya, you can turn your camera on, sorry. Um, our next speaker is Sue Martin. She's Director of Development for United Religions Initiative. Um, she works out of San Francisco, and she's in a room down the hall from me, um, and we're, we're both joining you from San Francisco, California. And finally, Grace Patterson is Director of World Faith. They are an organization that works with a diverse, religiously diverse teams of young people across the globe, help, helping them to collaborate on community development projects, and Grace is Program Director for World Faith. So how we're going to uh, go today, and if, at this time, if all my speakers can turn their cameras on, oh, I think they're on, which is great. Um, uh, the format for today is that I'm going to ask each of the uh, panelists to respond to a question, and then they're going to each respond to that in turn, um, and then we'll, we'll do a follow-up question, and then we're going to open it up for your questions. So um, start submitting them now, either via the chat box that you see right here, um, where everyone is chatting, or if you would like to submit them privately, you can do that by clicking on the People tab and clicking Chat next to my name, Sari. Um, and we'll get to answering all of those questions once our speakers have um, given us a little bit more about their background. So we're going to start with Danya, um, who works in Syracuse, New York, and the question that all of the panelists are going to be answering is this. Each of you has had success funding organizations and activities. Please tell us about some of your greatest successes and what made them possible. Danya, over to you. Um, and so since Danya's having some trouble, Grace, can I ask you to um, to share while we get her technology working? Sure, absolutely. Hi, folks. Uh, as Terry said, I am Grace, and I'm the Director of Global Programs for World Faith. World Faith is both an interfaith organization and an international development organization. Basically, we're premised around the idea that, uh, oh, we have Danya back. I'll keep talking. Yeah, just, just <laughs> Basically, keep going. We're premised around the idea that uh, religious violence doesn't just come from not being familiar with religious others. It also comes from underlying socioeconomic issues that lower the threshold for violence. So as Sari said, we mobilize teams of religiously diverse young people to tackle community development pro projects that are most pressing for their communities. So that's my, my work. Um, and my day-to-day -day life. And a big part of that is focused on fundraising primarily from small donors. Um, our organizational budget is, depending on how you look at it, um, either around $200,000 a year or $300,000 a year or under 100 um, based on global scale. But almost all of that comes from donations from small donors, people donating less than $200. Um, and we're able to do that because we have worked really hard over the last several years about thinking on what the donor experience is, right? Um, and being very mindful in considering what 
uh, someone who is choosing to share their donation with us experiences in that. Um, so often we solicit donations and say a brief thank you either by email or in usually by an email blast, right? Um, and the, that's all that a donor hears from us, particularly if they're not a high net worth individual, if they're just somebody who's giving um, what they can that is a small donation. So we have worked against that um, to try to make sure that every person who gives us a donation feels valued um, and continues to contribute. And we do that in a bunch of ways. But the overarching guideline for us is what's in it for them, the folks who are giving, and how can we make their experience as positive as possible. So we run a number of special events where folks can be present physically, working with us and hearing from us, us about what we're working on around the world. Um, we also, whenever possible, give personal thank yous in the form of a written note, a personal email, a phone call, um, follow-ups, one-on-one -on -one to make sure that each of our small donors knows that they are appreciated and supported. And we also make, sh make sure that they hear from us regularly about the impact that their donation is making. We're pretty good as an organization about making a dollar go very far. And so even folks who contribute 20, 30, 50 bucks, um, we're very intentional about making sure that they know that their $50 paid for lunches in schools for 50 children for a year in our chapter in India, in Delhi. So through all of that, through being physically present as much as we can with small donors, through making sure that we're in contact with them on a regular basis about the impact that they're having on our programs and on our world, um, and by continually reminding ourselves to think about the donor experience we have built a, a community of small donors that funds our programs almost exclusively. Thank you so much, Grace. Wow, I think that um, I think that um, that that platform you have of being able to fund your organization in such a way is one that uh, many of us are jealous of. Of. Um, we're going to try Donya now. So Donya, let's put your uh, microphone and camera back on and see if we can get you coming through clearly here. Okay. Donya, are you able to turn on your microphone yeah, and camera? Yeah. There we go. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Why don't you go ahead and... Where did... Oh, oh. Okay, try now. We lost you for a second. Where did I lose you before? Well, why don't you just start from the beginning, because from what you were saying, um, and just to remind our audience, um, each of our panelists are answering the question um, about where some of their greatest successes have come in fundraising and what made them possible. So, Danielle, I'll let you take it away. Okay, can you hear me now? We can hear you, and I will let you know if we stop hearing you. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. I'm sorry about that problem. Uh, as I was saying, Women Transcending Boundaries came into being after 9-11 and has evolved into a, a really diverse and multicultural organization that is a 501c3. Um, we have created throughout our community not only educational but many service projects uh, over the last 14 years that have been extremely uh, successful. And 98% of that funding either for, substan for sustainability of our organization or for individual projects has come from within the resources of our community, either through local foundations in their uh, mini grants or larger grants, uh, through businesses who have a vested interest in many of the projects that we have uh, instituted here, or through the university and county, state, and citywide resources that we've been able to tap into to create the positive influence that we want to make within our community. And I must say Syracuse is a very, very diverse community, which we are very blessed in that in that regards. Um, one project that you were mentioning successes, one of the projects that was very successful for us um, happened in 2010, which we called an Acts of Kindness Weekend uh, during the service weekend of, in September that President Obama had 
instituted. And this project came into being from a leadership grant that we uh, obtained through the local community foundation. Um, we actually brought together thousands of volunteers. I mean, literally thousands of volunteers for the whole weekend with hundreds of different projects, you know, be they small or big, um, and created a huge positive uh, culture that weekend uh, in diverse culture. And, and like I said, most of it, in all of it actually, primarily funded through the organizations uh, within our community. Uh, some of the projects that we did that weekend uh, were, were health clinics where we had local hospitals in seven different areas providing free services to many people, uh, building recreational facilities for underprivileged, underprivileged children, which was a huge project, uh, structural and painting projects within poor areas of our city, uh, park cleanups and paintings and bike giveaways and bike repairs, um, everything from small to, to large. Uh, our website contains pictures in, in all of the different projects that went on uh, for that weekend. And it was extremely uh, successful. We re actually received a, a great deal of media uh, from it, even from the New York Times, which we were very pleased about. Um, and also, you know, one, in fact, one particular project I will give you a little detail about, we took a law firm, uh, we asked a law firm to partner with the Syracuse City Police to build a recreational facility for teens and to get them off the streets. And that project actually continues today. That partnership that we were able to facilitate uh, continues today, as many of our projects do, uh, our community garden projects and in, in the many other projects that we do. Um, we have also provided microfinancing opportunities for the refugees in our community. We have a huge refugee population here. We also not only have done projects internally and within our own city and county, but we also support a girls' school in the Gambia through the Starfish Project, and we also helped to build a school in northern Pakistan on the border of Afghanistan, and that's a project that we continue to support um, through local donations and through, as I said, through uh, funding uh, through different resources in our community. And, and with, with saying all of this, you know, our, our ultimate goal is to, to provide uh, that bridge you know, of, of commonality between people and to bringing people together to create an atmosphere and an environment of peace. And we have been very successful, on, you know, through the years with these particular projects. And uh, but because of time restraints, I really can't get into too many more, but that, that is just a little bit of a flavoring of what we've done over the last few years. Hello? Hi, Danya. Thank you so much for sharing there that um, and how rich of a, an experience um, and funding diversity you have there in Syracuse. I think there's a lot we can all learn from that. Danya, can I have you move on to the second question, um, which is the question of where have you found money hiding in your community? You've talked a little bit about that, but can you tell us more about some of the unexpected places you found funding? Uh, and I'll have Danya answer that first, so just turn on your camera button to start talking. Okay, can you hear me? We can hear you great. Go ahead. You know, it's interesting, and none of us have learned this off the cuff uh, over, the, over the years. Many people within our organization, within Women Transcending Boundaries, has a, a network behind them, as we all do. All of us have uh, people we know, people that uh, that we know who can help us with certain projects. And I think that becoming aware of the, that resource is, is really important. Um, we've been able to find uh, funding. I didn't realize that the city, for instance, would donate land um, to nonprofit organizations for a community garden. We were not aware of that until we did some investigation on that. And that came about through one of our members who was a city employee. So sometimes the information comes to you through members or through uh, this, what we used to, we call the Verizon network behind us, all of us. All of us have talents and, and information that we share with one another that we can help to network those resources. 
Um, I was unaware that the city and the county also provides uh, many grants to nonprofit organizations. Many industries, uh, there's an industry here called the Welsh Allen industry, which is a, obviously the medical uh, device in, uh, company, has been extremely helpful to us in providing uh, grants and donations and resource information as to where we can find money for um, health clinics and projects that have to do with health related uh, projects that we are doing. So the, the information is out there. It's just a matter of, um, you know, finding them and becoming aware of where they are. And, and that's, it's, it's quite easy to do even through talking to people within your organization or within the city. The community foundation was a, it was a huge resource for us. Uh, and if you have a community foundation within your city or your in your community, uh, go to them. They have a, a multitude of resources uh, for nonprofit organizations as to where you can find funding. Hello? Hey, Danya, thank you. That was, was so helpful. Uh, I really appreciate you stepping in and answering that next. Um, so I'm going to have great can you actually answer this question as well? And then um, Sue's next to me and we'll have her answer both in one. Um, so the question is, um, where have you found money hiding in your community? Sure. So I think that uh, the easiest answer to this question, perhaps the most frustrating, is that where we've found money hiding is in people's wallets. Um, ultimately, I think the first crucial step to, to cultivating small donorship, which is my particular wheelhouse, is having the audacity to ask um, and to ask in a way that is empowering uh, for the person that you're asking, right? So lots of our, uh, our donors and the folks who have been really loyal to us over the years are, are people that we have personal relationships with um, and who we've been able to talk directly to and to say, this is what your money can do, uh, don't you want to be a part of it, right? Um, and an invitation to be a part of making positive change rather than we're really hard up for cash. Can you just give just a little bit, right? Um, that attitude makes a, a big, has made for us a big difference. And the other piece of this too, I think, is uh, when we're talking about asking, uh, the ask, we're talking about approaching people for partnerships and for giving, um, I think it's also really important to, as Danya was sort of talking about, to not just ask for, for funds and for funding from people, but also to ask what their strengths are um, and what they, what unique value they have that they could bring to your organization. So Danya was mentioning that connections to strategic partnerships wider than the individual were, came from members of the group. And I think we've absolutely found that to be the case too. We've also found that folks are much more invested in giving financially when they're involved in planning one of our events or being a part of something strategic at the organizational level. So the more invested they are in their time, the more invested they have been with their money. Thank you so much, Grace. Good nuggets here. I'm going to hand it over to Sue now, who has magically joined me, um, and hopefully doesn't sound like a robot now. And she's going to just kind of answer both of those questions in one, and then we'll move on to audience questions. We're getting a ton of them, and we're going to get to all of them, even if we've got to stay a little beyond the time. So, Sue? Through the miracle, miracle of technology, I have astro-projected myself <laughs> here with Sari, and um, I think uh, the women have uh, really hit on a lot of what I want to talk about. I am currently the director of development for URI, but I have been in this um, business a really long time and worked for a lot of different types of organizations, and um, many that have uh, much larger budgets and uh, much larger donors sometimes. But I think the most important thing that I would say um, that has made a difference in my success and the success of organizations I've worked with um, remains the same, is that people give to people. And whether you are asking for $100 or a million dollars, and I've done both, um, these steps inside are about, are pretty much the same. 
Um, both uh, Donya and Grace have talked about building relationships and how to get people involved because involvement is absolutely the first step to um, donorship. And another uh, another thing I've heard is that um, you can't be afraid uh, to ask because you need to remember you're not asking for yourself. You're asking for um, an organization that you believe in and hopefully you've done your good work and they believe in it. And so what you're really doing is offering them an opportunity to participate. And um, the other thing, and again, I think the ladies have touched on this, is that that first gift or the gift that you've been working on and finally get isn't the end of the relationship, it's the beginning. And I'm really impressed with what I'm hearing about um, the ability to keep these uh, donors involved and continue that relationship and continue to make that proposition of giving a win-win for both um, the organization and the donor. Um, so I think those are all really, really key points. You good? All right. Well, we're going to just sit here together and we're going to move into our um, a question and answer portion here. and. Uh, so for public questions, use the chat box. We've already got a bunch of them. If you have any questions you'd like to keep private, click the people uh, button and then click the chat button next to my name. Uh, and to give you some ideas of what uh, subjects our panelists can speak to, I've put together this little word cloud here. And they all have a variety of experience. And so more than what's in this word cloud, but also what's in this word cloud, feel free um, to ask your questions. And if we can't answer them at this time, um, our panelists have also all um, agreed to make their email addresses available to you so that there can be some follow-up if need be. Um, so I'm going to start panelists, since we're going to be in the question and answer now, why don't you all just turn on your cameras um, and you can answer the questions um, together separately or however um, seems, seems fitting. And if you want to see also um, the poll, it looks like uh, we've got almost an, a bit of an even split here between people who know a little bit, a moderate about, and a solid amount about fundraising. So keep that in mind um, as you ask, answer these questions. Um, so what I'm going to hear, uh, going to read out here, is um, how do you initiate relationships and donations? So the question here is looking at the crux of initiating um, that relationship. Sue, Grace said your name, so I think that means you should go. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, sure. So. I can speak personally that I had a lot of trouble with exactly this question, like how do you how do you ask and how do you begin um, when I first started doing this work? Um, and it wasn't until I was talking to someone who'd been doing it for a long time who said to me, Grace, you're not asking anybody for money. You're giving them an opportunity to change the world that I had any luck or any confidence in asking folks to support the organization. Um, but just that simple change of frame is that I no longer ask anybody for money. I tell people about the tremendous work that, that we're doing um, and the incredible impact we're having on people's lives. And then I give them an opportunity to be involved. And often that means inviting them to a special event, right? And setting the bar for entry very, very low so that it's really easy for them to participate and check it out. Um, and often it's like hosting, uh, a friend will have hosted an event and they'll be brought in and they are a prime person for me to be talking to about how excited we all are together to be doing this work. Um, yes, so I talk about the organization all the time. And I talk about it in a way that is exciting and empowering for people to get on board. Great. Yes, yeah, go ahead. Um, I was just, that's terrific, and I agree 100%. Um, and I would just play the other side of it because I think sometimes um, as development people or people doing development uh, in an organization, we are trying to convince everyone uh, that our organization is the best. And, you know, if we, we get uh, frustrated or let down if it's not um, 
uh, their cup of tea. I There are so many people that are interested in, in our case in URI, and um, if they're not, if it's not their thing, if their biggest uh, philanthropic interest is elsewhere, um, I don't sweat it. I mean, uh, you know, we do the best we can to get people involved, but it's not going to be, everything is not going to be everybody's interest. Um, and there are so many people that are interested. And um, again, those come via uh, friends, via um, things that we're doing out there visibly and publicly. And, uh, you know, that I don't waste a lot of time worrying about trying to talk people into it. Uh, because even no matter how good a job I do at that, it, it's still not going to be everyone's thing, and that's great. So um, to not get discouraged as you try to build your mailing list or your donor list, but to really look for people um, with similar interests who might be interested in your organization. Right. Thanks, Sue. Um, the next question I think is probably best oh, suited. Oh, oh. yeah, please. The saying. When you have a passion for a particular need and you can find the collaborators that you need around that project or around that program, it becomes a little easier, I think, to ask uh, for the donations. And many of the donations come to you, I have, I have found. When they find out that you're doing a particular project, you may have neglected to ask a particular party to join in. And they'll come to you wanting to say, gee, we'd like to help you with this. So I think finding that need and bringing that awareness to a community, you many donors will come to you, uh, and you don't even have to go to them, which has been really nice for us. So. That's great. I could <laughs> also just say that uh, I agree with everything that everyone's been saying. It's terrific to hear all of your thoughts. And also that stepping from – always asking and always being talking talking about what you're doing and what you're passionate about to like it being okay if folks are not uh resonating with what you're talking about but even sure. further to that to like your relationship with that person or those that organization or that group doesn't have to end there right um just because somebody is not particularly interested in that moment doesn't mean that they will always be uninterested it also doesn't mean that they don't know somebody else who would be interested in what you're doing or would be a great strategic partner for you. So good good people doing good work should continue to know one another, whether or not there's like an immediate uh, utility to that relationship. Mm -hmm. That's good. And since you mentioned, mentioned um, partnerships, I'll go into this next question, which is how can a small organization leverage partnerships to generate donorship through outside industries? I'll read that one more time. How can a small organization leverage partnerships to generate donors through outside industries? Uh, well, we are a very small organization. Well, not really small. We've actually grown over the years, but considerably smaller compared to Grace's organization and to, to URI. And the partnerships obviously uh, have come about through the vested interest uh, of the projects that we've been doing. Uh, we have a partnership with Interfaith Works here in Syracuse, which is a, a much larger interfaith organization than Women Transcending Boundaries. And we have collaborated on, on many projects because of the, the, the goal and the mission is so joined in the commonality of our organizations. So I think that you can create these partnerships just through your common interests. <clears throat> through common interest and through the passion of what you're doing. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that's answering the question for them. Um, most of our projects obviously are, are we, we look around, we, we see a need, and then we look to see who would be the best collaborators for that need. And then we approach these organizations or businesses and we have very rarely found uh, organizations or businesses who have not been willing to help. And, and that's been extremely a, a very positive thing for us. Um, so I think it's just a matter of finding your collaborators, finding who has a vested interest, and approaching them. And I think you'd be very surprised how many will come forward for you through donations. And, and actually through projects, when you do these in the, in the community and you get media attention, 
Uh, many people come forward to donate to your individual organizations uh, through those projects. Sunday, can you say? Want to become members? Yeah, could you say? Because it sounds like some of the the media attention that you have gotten has has helped in fundraising. That's not the focus of this, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. But could you briefly say, are there a few uh, easy steps people can take to try and get some of that media attention? We didn't really seek it. We've been very fortunate to have them come to us. We actually had CNN, Inter CNN International came and spent three days with us and broadcasted it overseas, what, with what our organization was doing. We've been in Oprah Winfrey's magazine, uh, Family Circle, we've been in New York Times a few times. I'm really not sure how they found out about us, but uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> we must be doing something right. They came to us. Um, we've been very fortunate to be part of Diana X Pluralism Project, which has obviously given us a great deal of recognition. Um, I think, you know, when you, we, we actually go to the media. We, we tell the media what we're doing. You know, we're, we're not, um, many members of our, our group have a particular talent uh, in media. You know, there again, it's looking within your membership, finding out what the talents and what they can bring to the table and what kind of resources they can bring to the table. We have many people who are doctors, lawyers, professors. They all bring this multitude of talents and networking uh, resources that they bring to the table that can help your organization. So don't, don't shy away from asking your membership uh, how they can help you uh, to, to bring about these, these, these things that you need. I don't know if that's answering the question that's, or not. That's I'm, great. Yeah. <laughs> if you had a secret sauce to get everyone into the New York Times, I think that'd be awesome. Mm -hmm. you. <laughs> and actually, I you went there, I, we're actually in there twice, and I guess that's never happened before. And the editor <laughs> called me and said, you know, you, we, you were in here twice, and we're not really sure how that happened, but we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> no, it was, it, was kind of, it was kind of cool that she... But, you yeah. know, there are many... Uh, I, I'm very glad that we've had the exposure. It's, it's really helped with our... You know, the sustainability of our organization mm -hmm. and its credibility. Right. Um, That's great. But, and I think the, the just, kind of the answer to your question is to do the right thing, that you're, you're doing your work um, and, and you're doing it well and with integrity and people are taking notice. Um, and I just want to bring in an, an audience comment, um, which goes back to the question we were answering before about um, – asking people for money and, and she says even by asking the uninterested who they might suggest that may be interested. I think Grace almost said that mm -hmm. word for word, which is, you know, even if a donor says no to you doesn't mean that they don't know someone who wouldn't be interested in funding the organization. Absolutely. Um, I want to get to a question um, that I think probably a lot of people have and I've heard it from many people, which is that um, it's easier to fund service projects than to fund your organizational structure. How do you fund your organization and operation? Um, I know that Sue has some experience in this, so I'll let her start, and then uh, if either of you want to jump in on this, please do. Well, um, uh, it certainly is easier, I think, um, although I'll be interested if my colleagues agree. Um, to get uh, special project support is very tangible. There's a lot you can point to. Um, I think that donors tend to think that operating support and um, is money they can't really put their their fingers on. Um, you know, nobody wants to pay for the pencils or the rent. Um, although I think that donors in general are getting a little more enlightened about that. Um, and actually, in fairness, URA has been incredibly fortunate, and that is certainly not every organization's situation to get almost exclusively uh, unrestricted support. Uh, so, so my challenges are slightly different. But I think that it is a process. There are funders. There are uh, grantors. There are individuals um, who understand the need for general operating support. It's certainly more likely to be individuals than it is to be foundations, in my experience. Um, but I think you also have to work with people in terms of um, educating them about the fact that the work does not happen if you can't pay the rent. And um, 
to sort of work to everyone's interest. If you know a particular donor is only going to fund a certain thing, then hopefully you're able to build in some of your administrative costs in that project um, and where you can find general unrestricted operating support, which again, in my experience is largely with individuals, what you are trying to then create is really that um, relationship with your organization so that that, and, and with, um, and a loyalty in their giving to that organization, to your organization, that um, allows them to keep coming back year after year and hopefully maintaining that support and feel great about it and feel proud of it and um, be recognized and credited with all the good work the organization's doing is the short answer. <laughs> uh, Grace or Dania, do either of you want to speak to that? Yeah, I think that uh, I, so much of this is framing, right? Um, and exactly what Sue is saying about um, administrative costs and how to think about them. Um, often we talk about our people as a program cost rather than an administrative Ooh. cost um, because ultimately without the person to run the program, um, we're not, we can't make it happen. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, so even when we're going after program funding, um, we often build in people and people's compensation as a program cost. So that's part of it um, for us. And another part of it too is that I, I would completely agree about educating people about why it, it's important to have somebody, uh, lights to turn on and somebody to walk in to turn them on, right? To flip <laughs> them. Um, and I think too, it's important to connect not just that person to the program, but the program to the impact it's having, right? Um, the more that we can collect data about uh, and have concrete ways of demonstrating how we're making positive change, um, the better we can be about connecting the people that are necessary to make that happen to the lives changed, right? right. That's great, that's great. Um, and just to want to answer a question that came in over the chat box, the session is being recorded, and so you will have access to all of these good answers and information uh, for days to come. And the panelists have also um, each given me their top recommendation of resources, and so you'll be getting that in a follow-up email, um, a two-page um, document that has some of their favorite resources um, for books and online things, so you can look forward um, to that. Um, Moving on to um, the next question, uh, which is, do any of the panelists have experience in in-kind donations? Um, do you have any suggestions? And I think that is alluding to, do you have any suggestions on how to get in-kind donations? Um, probably all of us do, <laughs> but um, Danya, it sounds like you're masterful at this. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, I think as you as your organization grows and you start getting the recognition and the respectability that um, that you receive from your positive uh, growth, um, these donations um, are, are pretty pretty easy to. I don't know. I'm not really sure how to answer this question. They just seem to flow in, you know, and flow out. So in kind donations are. Um, we we have no administrative costs, so we are a, a strictly an all volunteer organization because we are we're small. You know, we're not as large as as you or I or or World Faith. So it, I think it becomes a little easier for us. I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but um, I'm not sure actually what you're trying to to ask. To be honest with you, I think yeah. it dovetails nicely, Tanya, on what you were talking about in terms of identifying strategic partnerships, right? Because right. when we're talking about strategic partnerships, we are potentially talking about media. We're potentially talking about individuals who can sort of, like, for lack of a better word, evangelize in our communities about our organization. But we're also right. potentially talking about people who can make in-kind donations. Um, so folks who, for example, one of our uh, fan, one of our supporters, our organizational supporters, is a bar owner. And so when we do our annual gala, we uh, are there. Uh, we, we host the event there. And he's, it's not in kind, but it is at cost. So we get that access to that space. 
um, at a much cheaper rate than we would if we were just coming in off the street. Um, so yeah, the, those two pieces of like, again, leveraging your networks um, to, for strategic partnerships of in-kind donations and also thinking about it, not just necessarily as who will give us stuff for free, but who will give us stuff at cost um, so that they get to feel like they're doing a thing, a good thing with while still meeting their bottom line. Yeah, thanks, Grace. And just um, Sue's going to add something here as well, but I just want to make sure too for people who aren't familiar with the terminology of in kind. Uh, in kind is a donation that is not money, uh, but something that is gifted to the organization. So, like Grace was saying, the space um, their donor gave it to them at less cost than what he usually does, and so that's an in-kind donation. I know Danya um, took some students on a bus trip to the UN last year, and I think it was Whole Foods or community supermarket gave them breakfast to take on the bus. That's an in-kind donation. So that's the kind of things we're talking about, and it's a real big thing. Yeah, that's what I wasn't sure what you were talking about. You were talking about <laughs> Sorry. Um, I wasn't sure if you were talking about, because there are several different kinds of in-kind do donations. Hmm. You know, Some of them are very substance, and some of them are, are not. So yeah, that's very true. We've been very good about uh, being able to to accumulate many in kind in that particular area uh, donations from our community. The the whole I mean I I um, grew up in this profession learning that it's always e or, or it's frequently easier for a business or an organization to give you stuff versus cash. Um, and so oftentimes we would start out with cash and end up with stuff or services donated or discounted, as Grace said. But I think um, I do want to say something that comes up a lot and people get a little, even um, I get confused about. It's um, sometimes people want to give you stuff and it may or may not be the stuff that you need or right. that you want. <laughs> and um, I, yeah, so, um, uh, you know, if it's you're taking this bus trip anyway, so it's great that they're going to, you know, donate the bus for the time that you need, but it's not great if you don't take donors on trips and buses. Um, that's probably a, a, not a great example, but um, but food and um, I found wine here in Northern California um, and never, this is just me, but never assume you have to pay full price or even close to full price. I mean, if it ends up at that, you may be able to go to a competitor and say, hey, or, or and or tell that business, well, we, we really need to get this at a discount, so thank you, but, and they may come back. Another um, thing I'd like to say about in kind is um, recognition. I think that, and um, I imagine you guys have experienced the same thing, depending, um, businesses, much more so than people in my experience, like to have a sign that says, you know, this was brought right. to you by, or, right. um, you know, this bus was, uh, didn't, it didn't cost the organization anything because um, Joe's bus company donated it. So um, I find that goes a long way, even in venues that I wouldn't think anybody would really see or, or would be particularly great recognition, it means a lot um, to have a little sign that says brought to you by. So I just, I would, when you look at your budget for a small organization and it's going to cost this much to rent a meeting hall or whatever, start with what goes against those numbers in your budget. What are you going to have to pay for anyway? Um, I think that's particularly helpful and I think you'd be surprised. It's much easier than cash most of the time. Thanks, Sue. And I just want to I mentioned too, we have a user comment who said in the in kind donations also include volunteer time and services. So we're not yeah, just yeah. looking at tangible things, we're looking at those resources within your right. organization. I guess, I guess that's where I was thinking it was going, but <laughs> now that I'm cleared up on that. You know, actually, you know, when you bring parties I'll give you an example. We we put together a community found uh, community garden. As I told you, we received the land from the city of Syracuse. Mm -hmm. We partnered um engineering environmental engineering students from Syracuse University to build raised gardens for these refugee families who are living in this area and in this for this community garden. So, you know, they were getting a benefit. Most places, most donations, if you can show the benefit not only to what the project that you're doing, but the benefit to them, it's a win-win situation for everybody, you know, uh, when, they, when they come on board. Um, so, I mean, we brought in Syracuse Grows, which 
provided the plants for this uh, organization, for this community garden. Mm -hmm. um, when we had the actual planting of it, um, we had different uh, businesses provided food and we even had the local fire department volunteer twice a week to come in and fill the rain barrels, you know, That's for, awesome. for this garden, you know, <laughs> because they, they saw that this, this garden could bring about um, some, some community collaboration that mm -hmm. could bring about a more peaceful environment around them. That's so, great. you know, bringing together refugees along with the, with the community itself mm -hmm. and working side by side in this garden um, was, was, you know, in itself, a, a huge collaboration and required very little money uh, on our part uh, for this. Thank you so much, Tanya. Finding, I, finding the right partners together, you know, <laughs> finding the need, finding collaborative partners, and yeah. uh, many people jump on board because they're excited about it. Yeah, thanks, Tanya. And I just want to get to one question, too, that Barry um, put out, which I'll give to Stu, which is, um, how do you document in-kind donations? Do they require a tax certificate? Um, how do you deal with that? Well, with a nod to the fact that um, uh, I think Barry's in Africa, um, mm -hmm. which is, may have different tax laws, but in general, the way um, one would or, or I have acknowledged in-kind is for uh, the, what they've done versus their, it's, it's their business or their individual's um, responsibility to value it. I mean, I'm sure there are complex situations here like donations of art or real estate, but I don't think we're talking at that level. But um, so saying thank you very much for three hours of two donated buses uh, versus thank you for this value that $500. Um, Grace, you have a different, um, so that's how we would do it in the U.S. in terms of acknowledgement for tax purposes, but maybe you have more insight, Grace. I mean, it's going to vary significantly depending on where you are. Uh, yes, I, I would say that what you're describing is accurate to my experience. I should also say that, yes, uh, in-kind donations don't necessarily have to be things. They can also be services like tax accounting. So. <laughs> Yeah, they could do that for free for you. Uh, yeah, and we, and we actually do have that. We have an accountant who goes over our accounts every year for free, you know, and she's actually, she's actually the husband of one of our members. So there, there you go. go. Um, I just want to take a moment to recognize that it is 11 o'clock, um, which is our set end point, but our panelists have agreed to stay on and continue answering questions because we've got a lot of great ones here we want to get to. So I just want to take a moment to recognize the fact that if you did schedule yourself for something else at 11 or you do have to go, thank you for joining us. Um, thank you to our panelists for their time. Um, thank you to Big Marker for hosting us um, and to all the people who made this possible. I'm just going to tell you real quick what to expect next. And then we'll get back to question and answer just in case anyone has to leave at 11. Um, but we have this resource guide that will be coming your way. Um, like I said, it's got books and article recommendations, um, some websites, some things that you'll have to pay for, some that are free. Um, so be on the lookout for that in the next um, 24 hours or so, uh, because we're also going to be sending you a link to a recorded version of this webinar, which you can share with friends and family and fellow nonprofit uh, people in your community. Um, you'll also be able to access um, all of this by using the link that you use to register for this. Um, so if you still have that handy, you can check back. Um, we're not sure exactly how many hours it will take the system to process and post the video, but it will be within the next 24. So look for an email from us letting you know that it's happened. I'll also be sending out a post-webinar survey for you to fill out to give us some feedback. We do these webinars about three to four times a year, and we want to make sure we're continuously improving. Um, and I also just want to say thank you on behalf of URI North America, um, the North American region of United Religions Initiative. We're really glad and grateful to the panelists for joining us. Um, and for all of you attendees who have joined us, we hope that this has been useful. Um, and if you're not a part of URI right now and are interested in becoming a part of a global network of interfaith peace builders, uh, we have a lot of resources and tools and also global connections um, to bring you into this global family. So I'll put my email address in the chat box. It's just my first name, Sari, at URI.org. Um, and feel free to send me an email, and I'd love to connect with you. My position is regional coordinator for North America, um, and so I would be your point person. 
Uh, and so on that note, if you need to go, we understand, but we're going to keep answering the questions as they roll in here. And I want to get to one about volunteering because I think this dovetails well from our conversation on in-kind donations. And people have asked um, both how do you compensate volunteers? Um, and I want to just take a, a minute there to note as well that I think um, I was in a seminar a couple of weeks ago, and the panelists can speak to this as well, um, that talked about how you really have to be careful uh, with the legal issues around this because a lot of nonprofits end up getting most of our labor from volunteers. And so um, this is a tricky situation, and so I want to make sure as well that if you're not sure that you consult with a labor lawyer in your, in your state, um, and with that background, I'll hand it to the panelists to answer this question. But please know that if you're, you are talking about legal issues, we want you to consult a lawyer who knows your local laws. I would say with a big hug. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I compensate and volunteer to me is sort of an oxymoron. And I say that and I don't, don't misunderstand that. Um, volunteers are the lifeblood. But I'm not sure if this question um, meant uh, other ways beyond financially, which is sort of, again, the opposite. Um, Grace or somebody? <laughs> yeah, so I would say that if someone is a volunteer, they are not compensated, right? Yeah. If somebody yeah. is compensated, they're an employee, and we should treat them as such with, like, full consideration for, for their livelihood, right? Um, but if someone is a volunteer, we can absolutely show gratitude. Yeah. Um, and maybe that is a big hug, and maybe it is an invitation to an event where they will be celebrated, or maybe it's as simple as if they're coming to volunteer in the community garden, then they will provide lunch for them, right? Um, we can absolutely show gratitude to our volunteers, but they're not compensated for the work that they do, if that makes any sense. Yeah, and I, and I agree. Um, and, and many of the volunteers are not looking for that compensation either because they really are enjoying uh, doing what they're doing, or they wouldn't be doing it, I don't think. Um, we also, we've also taken the volunteers and had special dinners for them, you know, or like Grace was saying, you know, highlighting them at a particular dinner that we've had. Uh, we were very fortunate in our community to um, have Ruth Colvin, you know, who is the founder of Literacy Volunteers of America in our community, who actually helped us get started organizationally. And we um, actually highlighted her at one of our dinners to help compensate her for all the time and effort and wisdom that she gave to our organization in, uh, in this organizational inception at the very beginning. So, yeah, so yes, you can. You, there's very many ways of showing gratitude um, to your to your volunteers, but it's very important to do so. Yeah, and to thank you, Donna. Some way. And also, um, on a legal, another legal thought here from Claudia, who said you might want to check if you need insurance for your volunteers who are working in case they're hurt during the event or have them sign a waiver. So again, for these legal issues, make sure that you're consulting someone whose expertise that is, because we don't want to get you into any hot water. Hopefully you have a pro bono attorney that will. I want to move on to, we have two questions here about foundations and then a couple on major donors and, and getting new major donors as well. But um, two questions here about, I keep hearing different things about whether it's worth it or not to go after foundation funding. Some people say they get so many proposals, it's better to go after individual donors. What would you each say to that? Uh, Grace, why don't you start? Sure. So I would say that foundation funding can be a tremendous resource um, and has been for us. You're not wrong that there are a lot of people co competing for very little foundation funding. I would say that across the board, no matter what we're talking about, we're, all three of us are going to keep coming back to relationship building, right? Um, because the better your relationship with individuals at a particular foundation, the more likely you will be to receive funding from them, both because they know you and know your work individually, and also because you know them and understand what they're looking for and their particular missional guidelines and requirements, right? So the more that you, the other, the other piece of that, right, the relationship building is that 
often you will not meet someone from a particular foundation and be funded in the next funding cycle by that foundation, right? You will meet that person, you will continue that a relationship with that person, hearing about what they're working on, telling them about what you're working on, and three or four or five years down the line, potentially that turns into a grant from the organization that they're currently at or the organization that they're at then, right? Um, I think relationships are a key piece of this, no matter what. And I would just underscore um, what Grace pointed out. It is not the answer to the funding that you need by the end of your fiscal year, which closes in four months. Um, most of the time now, Don has had some other um, luck in smaller grants she was telling me about, but I just want to add one more stat, which I think everyone, um, well, everyone uh, on this panel knows for sure. 95-ish percent of the money given, um, at least in the U.S., it comes from individuals. So again, when you're looking at the size of the pot, so to speak, that's mostly where it's gonna come from, which doesn't mean you shouldn't, if you have the wherewithal and the resources, explore foundation funding. Um, and whatever research you can do around that, whether it's the foundation center, somebody asked about that, um, you know, again, it's a cost benefit. What, how, you know, how much money do you have to invest in this? How much time do you have to invest in this? Grant writing takes time, et cetera. Um, but in fairness, I know Donya has a slightly different experience. So, um, um and before yeah. I hand over to Donya, too, can someone also clarify for, uh, um, foundation funding and grants? Are they one in the same and how are they different? I would say mm -hmm. it's the same. But yeah, most of them come through grants through foundations from my experience. I don't know about the others. Uh, Could be government grants as well, but in general, don't you think, yeah. guys, when you say grants? And, and there again, you know, we're every community, if you look around, you'll find small foundations who provide uh, grants for different nonprofit organizations. I was really surprised when I started looking around the Syracuse and northern New York um, area at all the different foundations that are out there that do provide funding uh, for different projects or, or items that are going on. I mentioned a few, uh, the Welsh Allen. Uh, we also have another one called the Rosamond Gifford Foundation, the Snow Foundation. These are all within our local area who provide uh, grants, either some very large and some very small, depending on what you're looking for, to organizations. And I think that Sometimes we overlook some of these smaller foundations because we look at the larger ones. You know, and some of these smaller foundations are, are very capable of giving you uh, the grant money that you need. I mean, we've, we've uh, obtained grants from foundations with different religious organizations uh, in, around our area. Mm -hmm. So, in you know, families, families who have provided endowments in grants in foundation, through foundations. Um, there again, the community foundation, if you have a community foundation in your area, <clears throat> usually has a resource of all the local uh, funding foundations in your area. Uh, they are the, actually the ones who, who kind of steered us into the directions of where we needed to go to look for these foundations because they work with them. They're a philanthropical you know, organization that does this. So. It's, you know, look within your area. I think you'll be surprised that the smaller foundations are just as beneficial as some of the larger foundations. Thank you, Danya. Um, I'm trying to pick where to go next year. I'm going to go with one um, that uh, came in earlier. So for those of you who put your questions up, out later, just hang tight. We're going to get to them. Um, but can you talk about the ethics? of um, accepting funding from organizations whose activities may be perceived to be detrimental to the greater good. Is the money more important than the implied collaboration? Can you repeat that again? That was... Sure. So um, we're asking the panel to talk about the ethics of accepting funding from organizations whose activities may be perceived to be detrimental to the greater good. Is the money more important than the implied collaboration? Oh, good question. <laughs> Not sent to that one. Uh, somebody else. I've never had that experience. Grace, but, uh, I bet you have. <laughs> yeah, Grace, I bet you have. You have a larger, much larger organization. How do you handle that? Um, well, I'll say first that, that 
it is an ethics question, not an expertise question, right? Mm -hmm. So there is no one right answer that we, the panel, could give you um, as, as a guide other than your gut, right? Um, you do, whenever you're considering accepting funding from anyone, you have to consider their uh, public presence and the impression of, of them, right? Um, you have to also consider that uh, perception in our field, right, in the interface world, because the public perception and the interface perception will not always be the same, right? Um, and also internally what your values are as an organization and personally what your values are as a human. Um, it's never easy to make that kind of call, but ultimately we all make a, a value judgment of our own. I don't know that that's helpful to you. Um, I think, Grace, I would add as well for, this is what your board is for. Ask your board. Yeah. Don't make a decision on your own about this. Um, because this has large potential for your whole organization uh, one way or the other. And so um, this is part of why organizations have boards is to make these, these decisions and collaborations. So um, if, if this is a question you're having, make sure you're, you're bringing um, your board into that conversation. I would just add that, um, and this may not be representative of those on this call, I have been asked this question many more times than I have ever had to deal with it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I wish I had people um, trying to give our entities, trying to give me money for as many times as I've been asked the question. Um, so I don't know if this is, um, you know, I face it a bit in um, my AIDS work, um, HIV AIDS stuff. But short of that, I really, um, so that's not, I don't want to dominate the conversation with that, but uh, just uh, if, for those people new in development who um, fear they may be fending off uh, demons in the community trying to throw buckets of money with them, I, I wouldn't worry too much. <laughs> no, I wouldn't either. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's move on to another one. Um, do the panelists have any experience with crowdfunding? Any suggestions? Grace is nodding her head, yeah. so I'll let her go. And then I've been to a seminar on this, so I can, <laughs> can pass along some information, but not experience. <laughs> well, I guess I, that's a new term, a crowdfunding? Sure, Maybe Grace, like, why don't you um, define what that is as well before you start talking about yeah, it? Yeah, thank you. Sure. So <clears throat> by crowdfunding, we're talking about uh, using platforms like Kickstarter or Indiegogo oh or things like that um, to fund a project or a, an initiative through a number of like micro donations, we might even call them. Um, so that's what crowdfunding is. I've run a number of um, Kickstarter campaigns for folks. Um, and I can tell you a couple of things. One, crowdfunding works way better for products than it does for projects. Um, uh, that's particularly true of like, because all of it is reward based for the most part, the most successful ones, you like get a certain reward for a certain amount of donation, right? Um, and that's, that's true not only of crowdfunding, think of your public radio station, um, which is exactly the same thing. Um, so it works much better when you've got a physical thing to give somebody than it does when you're trying to fund a project on just like excitement alone. Um, but I would also say that it works much better when you've got a pre-existing mailing list, a pre-existing group of people to push this particular campaign to than if you were trying to put your campaign on one of these platforms for your project to be on one of these platforms and hope that the, pro the platform will buoy the, the situation. That said, this is the what's true. Of, it's true of crowdfunding. It's true, I think, of, of and Sue, tell me I'm wrong if I'm wrong, of grant funding as well. But like, start small, right? The, you're much more likely to have a successful crowdfunding campaign for a $2,000 project than you are to try to raise $150,000 to revitalize your organization on a crowdfunding platform. The same is true of grant funding. If you've never been funded by a foundation before, you're probably not best off 
applying for several hundred thousand dollars, right? Um, yeah. And by the same token, you'll be much more successful in any of these venues if you can point to a smaller thing you did really, really well not too long ago. Yeah. Bravo. And I want to just echo what Grace has said, that um, the statistics show that you need to be able to fund, I believe it is 30% within the first 48 to 72 hours. So if you're thinking about how big should our crowdfunding go, that first 48 to 72 hours is going to be your friends and your family. Uh, and, and those are who's going to give. So think of how much can you garner from those people in the first three days. And then that should be 30% of what you're asking for overall. Um, and also, I think there's kind of a perception um, that crowdfunding is easy. Oh, well, I'll just put up an Indiegogo and then it, I'm going to get all this money. And it does not work that way. You will put up an Indiegogo, but you won't get money. Uh, you have to really be ready for an intensive time of fundraising for your organization, much like you would if you were going into a year-end campaign or a capital campaign. Be prepared for crowdfunding to take your time um, and to be prepared with communications, with videos, uh, with perks, like Grace was saying, where you reward people for giving you money. Um, they can be things like thank you cards and hugs, but uh, that's kind of how the platform works. So um, keep that in mind. And um, also paid advertising uh -huh. works. Okay. Um, if you determine that, like, all of these campaigns are going to uh, be best supported by social media presence, right, um, and by folks sharing it <clears throat> widely, um, so the more people that you can reach through social media, the better. And paid advertising on social media is very sophisticated, such that you can put in $10, right, for a campaign for – for three days and target it to people in a specific geographic region, people who are interested in specific keywords, and you can test it. And if you're a little bit of a nerd like I am, you can test it and sort of watch for what the cost per acquisition is for a person. Um, and if you can determine that the return on that investment of somebody going to your site is, is good enough, then you can make paid advertising work for you in a really tremendous way. But it's all about testing small segments. Wow. Thank you, Grace. Great. This is good. Uh, so I want to move on to a question about, actually, real quick, this dovetails, and then we'll get to the question on major donors. But um, what are your opinions or experiences on selling products to raise funds for your organization? Anybody? I, I could talk about it, but anybody else? Uh, Donya, you're muted as well. Hold on one second. I was getting some feedback from you, so I muted you. All right, go ahead now. No, I was just thinking, I don't think we have ever sold any particular products to fund our organization. I'm trying to think, no, we never have. We've never had to do that. Okay. Grace or Sue? Grace? <clears throat> We've done it just a little bit and in a very irreverent way. Um, so it's like, the, we we did a, a campaign where we sold World Face T-shirts and billed it as the most expensive T-shirt you'll ever buy that'll uh -huh. do the most good, right? Um, so we have we have wrapped in sort of like uh, physical things as a part of like getting more uh, in engagement with our fundraising campaigns, but we've never just like sold in a store or an, uh, an online store like World Face merch if if that's what we're talking about. Um, yeah, I have um, a good amount of experience with it, but it's mostly with larger organizations, I would say like museums who have a museum shop or something like that, which isn't really relevant um, in this discussion or crowd. I would say the one thing is that it comes in um, accounting-wise, it's different kind of income. It's called unrelated um, something business income. Anyway, it's not obviously not contributed. Um, it's and. You, as a nonprofit 501c3, I don't know, the laws may be different in different countries, but you can only have a certain amount of it. Um, it's a different conversation, I think, if we're talking about um, giving away things, um, you know, talk fees, like you were talking about public radio earlier, that's different. But literally selling things to raise money is um, – something else. It's a different animal and a little bit tricky in terms of a regular 501c3, in my experience. All right. Um, next question. You guys are doing great. We are just rolling <laughs> rolling here. Um, 
how do you find new major donors? Um, and someone also defined major donor. And I'm Grace, if that's okay with you and Donna, I'm going to default to Sue because I know Grace, most of your donors are smaller. Um, okay, so we'll go to you. Well, <laughs> and I think it's a, it doesn't really matter, but everybody does define major donor differently. But I bet Grace. Um, and and Donna would answer this the same way. How do you find new major donors? You start with your less major donors and get them to become your major donors. I mean, it's always great when your first gift from someone is a hundred thousand dollars or whatever would be huge for your uh, ten thousand um, dollars. But um, generally, people, as Grace was talking about earlier, put a toe in the water, see how you treat them. Um, and uh, work up from there. I mean, it's a lot, of, you could spend a lot of time and a lot of Rolodex uh, troweling um, for rich people. You know, if I have one more person say, have you ever thought about Oprah? Um, have you ever thought about Bill Gates? You know, we've all had a word or, um, yeah, we have. So is everyone else and they don't know it. So, um, Anyway, uh, that's what I would say, um, that, that you start with your own folks and work up and obviously keep your eyes open. But uh, So on that, how do you determine who has the potential for that? Um, you know, it, I, I think there are some fundraising probably tricks that you use to determine who to target I'll from let, your current donors. I'll let, uh, Grace, why don't you talk about both those things? Because um, I bet you can answer that. Well, I completely agree with the the way to find major donors is to be really good to your small donors um, because many of them will turn into major donors. That's true the the longer that they're in relationship with you. That's also true, particularly for us, we're, we're an organization geared specifically to young people. And so a lot of our donor community is young people. So the the longer that they are involved with us, the older that they get, the more money they make, the more money they'll give, right? Um, so yes, absolutely right that it, as a baseline, you treat all of your small donors really well, and many of them will turn into major donors. Um, and should say too that many of them will introduce you to friends um, who are have the potential to be more major donors. Most of our significant donors have been introductions from people who are already in our network, but we're not prepared to be major donors. Again, whatever we're calling major. Um, and if the, so your small donors are not only people who will become major donors, but they're people who will explain to folks who might be major donors how tremendous their impact has been with the organization with very little money um, and how positive their experience of giving to the organization has been. And to Sari's question about how do you find out what their capacity is, Grace, I mean, you can do, there's all sorts of expensive vehicles for research, but Grace just made a really good point. Somebody will say, you know, I don't really have that much money, but my friend Sally, you know, she's loaded. I should introduce you to her. I mean, I'm sure you've had that experience. So, um, you know. Or, again, bringing them to an event, yeah. right? Yeah. Um. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in. I just wanted to ditto what Grace was saying, you know, about the relationship building. These smaller donors do know other people. This is what I was talking about, having a network behind you. They know people who maybe are larger contributors. We've had that happen uh, many times for us, uh, where other smaller donors or smaller contributors to projects that we've been doing or to our organization have brought the awareness of our organization to others who become passionate about what we're doing, and then they become donors. So it, you know, it's, it goes back to what we were talking about with relationships in networking. Thank you. And um, I'm just going to give everyone a heads up. I was just told by our tech people that uh, the webinar will automatically <laughs> shut off after, at 11.30. So we've got four more minutes. We'll try and get more questions in. Uh, but if we miss yours, I'm sorry. <laughs> There's nothing we can do about it at this point. Um, I want to, uh, so we'll try and get to two more questions, and this one is for our non-U.S. based folks who are asking, for people who are outside um, the U.S., particularly this person's asking from Africa, they look overseas for donor money. They look to the U.S. and Europe. How do we start to connect to these resources? What are you guys? Yeah. My name is Grace, and I run an organization called World Faith, <laughs> and we help small grassroots organizations, mostly in Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, to access funding 
from larger institutions overseas. So email me for sure. Oh, great. Um, <laughs> I'm going to email you. That's great. <laughs> You're not my audience. <laughs> No, I, I, I mean, I think this is a tricky question. We're dealing with it at URI, and, and, you know, we're dealing with both sides of it, so thanks. Great. So we'll actually, we'll have you follow up with Grace, and her email address will be in the follow-up material you get. Um, the final question, I think this is to Donna, Donya, sorry. How could organizations use service projects and collaboration to generate funds? And, Donya, you're muted, so just unmute yourself real quick before you start talking. Go ahead and repeat that question for me again, please. I'm a very sure. visual person, so auditory questions sometimes I have to have repeated. No problem. I'll put the question in the chat box as well. But the okay. question is, how can organizations use service projects and collaboration to generate funds? Oh, I think that speaks obviously for itself. When you bring the, the project is successful in your community and others see it, um, other people start to, you know, notice what you're doing and the, the funds become easier to obtain. They have, for us anyway, because many of our projects have been very successful, um, bringing all of that success to to potential donors and potential businesses that we want to, to use as collaborators has, has been, you know, your successes are what bring the, the donations, I believe, um, in the partnerships that we are doing. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to do one last question here since we have a minute. This is more nitty gritty, but does anyone have an opinion regarding the Foundation Center and is it worth a subscription? Somebody smaller like that. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be located in New York City where we have access to the physical Foundation Center space. Um, and that's been useful for us to find out what sorts of, or, of foundations are funding work like ours. Um, if you don't have access to the physical space, I can't really speak to whether or not it would be worth it because we don't pay a membership fee. Access to that space is free. It, it's just cost benefit. What kind of budget do you have? And oftentimes you can piggyback on somebody else if you can't afford the annual fee, um, some other nice nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, okay, so before we get timed out and get cut off rudely, let's just um, end this in a very nice way by saying thank you um, to all of our panelists for their time. Thank you to our audience for these questions. This has been such a robust conversation. Just as a reminder, we will be posting this um, on Big Marker as well as our website. You'll be getting an email with a lot of information. And if any of you have fundraising resources that you want to share with the rest of us, please send me a link. My email is sari at uri.org. And I will include those in our uh, sheet, our resources sheet, that is going to be going to everyone who registered for this webinar. So if you have any resources that you want to share, please um, email them to me. Today would be great.